Well, welcome, um, everyone. Um, we are on Zoom in a little bit of a different webinar format, um, which um, hopefully, and again, th I want to thank, well, first let me introduce myself. I'm Michael Goldberg. I'm the executive director of the Beal um, Institute for Entrepreneurship at um, Case and one of the professors for this class. Um, and joined by my colleagues, Doug DiGirolamo and Megan Buchter and Megan's daughter. Big fan of, big fan of this session. Um, and I wanna first um, thank everybody for joining if you're on Zoom or, or Facebook Live. And we have a little bit of a different format with this webinar format. So I can promote some people kind of into the panel. And for those that are attendees and from the community, it's awesome to have you here. Um, and we will look forward to your questions. Please go ahead and put questions. I think we decided the easiest way to do it is to put them directly into the chat. And um, Eddie, who's our student moderator, will be kind of leading the discussion with Becca and, and kind of incorporating questions into the chat. Um, and please do, and I think I see already a number of our students remember to do this, put your LinkedIn profiles in there as well, because we, we'd love to encourage networking between students and um and those from the community that are watching so um it's great to have back on just a quick promo for two more events this week we have only seven entrepreneurship sessions this week that are on the web you know crushing it with all of our programming tonight at seven o'clock um we have a kind of a deep dive on columbia the country of columbia with nelson Reyes from project columbia um, that'll be moderated by Bailey Capel. And then tomorrow at noon, we have the kickoff of our Beyond Silicon Valley cohort that's focused on entrepreneurship and the crisis. And we'll be joined by Lisa Delp, the former executive director of the Third Frontier, um, Stephen Coltai, who ran um, the entrepreneurship program at the State Department under Hillary Clinton, and uh, Yusal Sabaz, who is based in Ankara, Turkey, where he works with um, governments and, and corporates. So we've got a number of programs this week and check your schedule for next week as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Eddie, who is going to moderate our session today with uh, my good friend, Becca Brown. Oh, let me tell one funny story because I thought of it before. Uh -oh. I think about technology. Um, Becca is such a, a technology person that, um, and a huge sports fan. And it's kind of <laughs> apropos now that we're not, we have no sports. Um, Becca and her family were nice, so nice to invite us over for a dinner on a Sunday evening at the end of January, early February. And um, it happened to be the night of, I'm not sure which Super Bowl it was. And um, This was about 10 or 15 years ago. And I was like, oh, are we coming? Is it a Super Bowl party to watch the Super Bowl? And of course, the answer was, oh, I, I didn't know it was the Super Bowl. And then Becca wheeled out like a TV with like rabbit ears. Our students have never, maybe except for Daryl, have never seen um, like antenna, but it was good. So we watched the Super Bowl. So it was this ongoing joke of like this year's Super Bowl party at the bronze. So it's really so fitting we're in this tech space together today. It gets, uh, it, the, I didn't know the Super Bowl was going on at all. And you didn't ask if it was a Super Bowl party. You assumed it was a Super Bowl party. <laughs> and you showed up with your whole family with like chips and beer thinking you were at a Super Bowl party. And I was like, wait, it's a Super Bowl today? <laughs> so good. We'll know that social distancing is over when everybody on the call today is actually invited to Becca's house in January to end social distancing for the Super Bowl party. So yeah, we'll, that's right. You feel right. Okay. All right, with that, enough from me, over to you, Eddie. Hey, everyone, welcome to our conversation with Becca Braun. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Becca and everyone for coming today uh, to listen to her talk. Uh, so first, I just want to introduce kind of uh, Becca and what she's done. Um, so she currently is in charge of Braun Inc. Um, for about the past 10 years or so. And before that, she was the president at Jumpstart, which is here in Cleveland that helps um, local startups. Um, so first, my first question for you, Becca, is uh, kind of take us through what is Braun Inc. and what, what, are you guys, what are you guys doing now? Sure. Thanks, Edward. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. I'm really glad to be here. And thanks for everybody who is uh, uh, dialing in, calling in, zooming in. Um, so Braun Inc. is we uh, do a couple of things, but we're essentially executive and CEO speech writing and book writing. Um, we ghostwrite uh, for all kinds of people. Um, we basically have two main uh, lines of business, if you will, or lines of service. One is we 
uh, ghost write books, um, articles, and speeches for um, mostly CEOs, but also anyone else. We have written um, about 21 books, I believe it is, ghost written uh, for people of those 21 books that we have ghost written uh, about probably 15, uh, 16, 17 are for CEOs, but we also, um, we like ghostwriting. We specialize in business, but I have certainly had plenty of uh, friends, colleagues, community members, family members, whoever, not, not my family members, but families of other people who have also requested that we ghostwrite a book for them that has nothing to do with business. Uh, we do a lot of speech writing. We started as a speech writing organization um, and we did speech writing until uh, one of the CEOs for whom I was writing speeches asked if I would ghostwrite his memoir. So that's how we got into the book writing. Um, so that's one line of business is essentially ghostwriting mostly for business people, um, but not exclusively. And then the second line of business is the, what we call the Braun Collection. And the Braun Collection is our suite of um, executive biographies, memoirs, comic books, uh, conversation cards, uh, by, for, and about CEOs, but uh, not for CEOs, but by and about CEOs that are for a student audience. So these are for um, business students, MBA or undergrad students, uh, uh, business professionals who may be undertaking um, lifelong uh, learning and training, and simply the consumer lifelong learner. So that's our Braun collection of uh, products. And those are published by Braun Inc. We do ghostwrite the memoirs like the Lanham Napier memoir that you saw. Um, so we do ghostwrite um, those for the CEOs and we publish them under our name. Um, so that is what we do. That's great. Uh, so now that we can have a base of understanding about what Braun Inc. does, um, obviously the main crisis that everyone's dealing with and the reason that we're all remote right now is the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've had some questions in the chat about how Braun Inc. has been adjusting. Uh, so one of the questions uh, came from Greta Lazara, who asked how the pandemic has affected the quality and availability of um, your products. Sure. Okay, great. Um, thanks. Who, who asked that question? You said Gretchen? Some, uh, Greta. Greta. Okay. Thanks, Greta. Um, as far as the uh, pan, you know, um, I have had a couple of projects get uh, canceled because they were um, events that were to be held and I would write speeches uh, and whatnot for the events. So I had a couple of them get canceled. And so um, that is, I don't know if I'd call it the downside, but you know, it's not good. There was a, a pretty full and robust pipeline of speeches and articles that people uh, wanted uh, our help ghostwriting. And I have a team of about um, it, look, it's a big team of contractors, but each person is very specialized and they only do on average four hours of work per week for my company. So I have a team of about 20 people, but those 20 people, again, are the equivalent of about two FTEs. Okay. So in any case, um, uh, so we, um, we I, a couple of projects got canceled, but then others uh, repurposed their projects. So for instance, one, instead of doing a keynote speech live, uh, they are going to do a video. And so we're switching it over to a shorter video script. Um, and so uh, that's an example of a change. Um, and there are other, I've read, I, uh, we really, um, the team and I, but uh, I lead it. So I ghostwrite for um, several healthcare CEOs. So CEOs who are um, head up either uh, hospitals or, um, innovation institutes or and um, uh, tech companies. And they've asked me to do articles um, uh, that um, uh, suggest how they can help with the uh, COVID-19 and coronavirus crisis. So those are some examples of some changes. Um, as far as the students and the Braun Collection product, you know, I mean, I think um, teachers are not suddenly saying, uh, I'm going to an online world, so um, I suddenly absolutely need to change my syllabus and the content I was using and add new content. So that's not happening, and that isn't uh, by any means a surprise. Um, but I think that uh, as they increasingly go online, 
they will uh, need um, content that can be adapted to online purposes. So I do think that this uh, COVID crisis uh, theoretically is neither a um, problem or necessarily an opportunity for us, um, but I, I sort of just take it in stride as another, um, another piece of information for us as we sell our product. Yeah, we, we had another question. This is from uh, Shaviga who asked about if there was an increase in eBooks and I, you, you kind of addressed that um, in your response about how people maybe aren't changing their um, syllabi, but they are maybe in interested in different products. Um, so I think that's a, another way that um, you're doing well with this crisis. Uh, Another question that we got now, we're going back to your time at Jumpstart a little bit. Um, how the, your time at Jumpstart impacted um, your time at Braun Inc. and what you've been doing there? And that came from Antonio Iannotti. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I, I wanna hear, actually, can you repeat that question? Cause I, I was sort of thinking sure. about, I wanted to address the ebook thing, but repeat that question and I'll sure. answer that as well. Um, how your experience at Jumpstart has impacted your work at Braun Inc. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, okay, so just going back for a second to the ebooks question, ebooks have have been and were rising in um, just in general, you know, consumer ebooks, et cetera, as, you, as I'm sure you very well know and appreciate and have experienced, they obviously were uh, increasing in usage and popularity, and they have been and certainly also at the um, school and university level. Uh, what we know is that um, with respect to ebooks and students, Students um, are, you know, uh, the surveys show that students are frankly pretty sick of ebooks, um, uh, reading online, uh, highlighting things online. Uh, they don't love by any means the ebook format, and a lot of teachers give feedback face to face that they do not love the ebook format. Um, it's really mostly about uh, cost reductions and, uh, you know, decreasing the cost of education, and materials are a portion of that. And so that is why uh, ebooks get used. Um, I am absolutely a fan of actual print materials, as much as that may not be uh, great for the environment, and we do try to address that in various ways. But in any case, I'm a big fan of it, but um, the reality is that uh, certainly um, education uh, uses uh, ebooks now during the uh, COVID and Corona crisis, and it'll probably um, continue and accelerate after the crisis ends um, because people will become accustomed to it. But um, uh, I, I don't think um, I'd be curious to know if y'all have strong opinions, but I've got four teenage kids and uh, one in college and two in high school and one in middle school. And, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't learn as well and they don't like uh, the ebook format, but it's just a reality for cost control. So anyhow, okay, so back to Jumpstart. Um, how is Jumpstart? Let's see, you know, I think um, there are, uh, 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 I guess a, a few things. I mean, I saw at Jumpstart um, when we invested, you know, I, I um, helped lead uh, the, uh, you know, whatever it was, 50 or 60 investments we made in uh, equity investments we made in mostly tech companies in the Northeastern Ohio area. And in any case, um, what I saw with that is that as you uh, raise capital, equity capital, angel and venture capital, seed capital, pre-seed, but whatever the case may be, that high growth path, that equity path, um, I did see you have to really want to go that route. I mean, that is uh, imminently or eminently clear. You really have to want that route. Um, you know, there are other uh, routes that are, um, not not better, but certainly um, a better fit for many, if not most, if not, yeah, if not most businesses. Um, the best way to raise capital, of course, is through uh, revenues, go out and sell. And uh, before you take on any outside capital, the most important thing to ask is why, why can't I just sell my way to financing this? Um, why can't I get customers? Am I just a bad salesperson? Because being a bad salesperson is not a reason to take on uh, equity capital. Um, so you see that because you see the number of entrepreneurs who want the money but don't want the strings that come with it. And you know, with the money, absolutely come strings. I mean, it's not it's not free money. This is not happy fun camp. It is growing your company rapidly and taking on outside investors and steadily decreasing 
your control stake in the company over time, each round takes approximately 33% on average of the uh, cap table of the equity in the business. And so by the time you get to round CDE of capital, uh, you no longer have a control stake in the company. And even at round A, you've given up some board seats. So that informed how I wanted to grow the business, that I wanted to grow it steadily and slowly until I decided I wanted to take on capital. And I did take about uh, 2010, August of 2010 till last year to um, uh, build up my own knowledge base, my own control, my own understanding of the industry, uh, my own expertise, uh, et cetera, my own confidence, so that if and when I went out for capital, um, I did have that base of um, knowledge and understanding so that I could control the company uh, for the long term. Um, my capital raise, I'm happy to talk about it later if somebody asks a question. Um, it was a very, very dissatisfying experience. So um, I can simply uh, say that and maybe we'll address it later, maybe not. But I would say the knowledge I gained from seeing, you really have to want to take that path uh, a lot. And you have to, it has to be, it should be a path, not of last resort, but a very, very carefully considered path. Yeah, let's take it back a step then um, to when you started Braun Inc. What led you to that idea and how, how were those first year, how were those first couple of years like? Great question. Okay, um, sure. Uh, I actually started Braun Inc. and it was called the Braun Group um, uh, before Braun Inc. We changed the name a couple of years ago. But in any case, I started Braun Inc. back in 2003, actually. Uh, it was a part-time gig. Um, and what I did was I loved, I've always loved uh, writing. Um, I had been a journalist, I had been a travel guide writer, I'd been a sports writer, I had been um, an academic writer, so I had done all kinds of different writing. I always loved it. And so when I was um, co-founding Jumpstart with Ray Leach and Lynette Grease and others, um, I also wanted uh, to uh, do about eight hours a week of CEO speech writing. So that's what I did, is I would just, you know, get up at five in the morning and um, uh, go out and uh, do these speeches for CEOs, write them up and um, do that. So that's what I did. Um, I've always believed in having a side gig. Um, I think it's a terrific way to go for anybody who wants to be entrepreneurial. You need that, um, for lack of a better word, that cash cow or that lily pad to jump off onto. Um, should you, um, you know, have a strong and independent mind and uh, not uh, necessarily work great with bosses, it's helpful to have your own, your own gig that you can jump off to um, should you need it. So that's why I did the speech writing, have my own independent gig, and I loved it. I'm passionate about writing. I love business. It's business is fascinating. I love it. I love the action orientation, the decisions. So I did that. And then um, 2010, uh, I, that was 23 to 2010. I was then um, starting to realize that uh, the nonprofit sector was, was a sector that I uh, tremendously uh, value, but I felt that my uh, talents were better used in the for-profit sector. That's why I got my MBA. Um, that's what I wanted to do. I love the action orientation there. I wanted to leave and I needed a reason to leave. And one of the CEOs I wrote for said, would you ghost write my book? And he was willing to pay up front for it. And I just realized this is, this is my this is my uh, lily pad, I can jump off onto this and do this. So it was great and I worked out with Jumpstart to essentially get a consulting gig to consult back to them for a little bit too. Um, and the combination works great. Yeah, that, that's really good. Um, we just got a recent question, this is from Han, um, who asked about something new that Braun Inc. is doing about CEO biographies in the form of e-comic books. Um, can you tell us more about the educational tools you're offering to professors and classes and what the response to that is like, especially in these e-comic books? Uh, sure. Okay, great. That was Han, did you say? Yes. Han, great. Thanks, Han. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, so we do, we have, uh, we offer uh, books, um, we offer e well, we offer books and um, we call them true business adventure tales. That's the billionaire bust that some of you may have looked at, uh, perused, or even uh, read very deeply, I'm sure. Uh, in any case, uh, we have books in print and ebook format. We have comic books in print and e comic book format. And we have conversation cards in print and e, e digital format. So the comic books. Um, are short, they take five minutes to read and then another five minutes if you wanna get into um, actually looking at the end notes. Um, and I love them because I love the visual format. Some people are uh, visual learners. I was just uh, before this, uh, 
this, uh, this call, this Zoom meeting started for the public, Michael Goldberg was saying that he, uh, Professor Goldberg, sorry, he was saying that he, um, he uh, could visually remember where students sat. So he's an example perhaps of a visual learner. But um, so I like the comic books because I love taking that sort of uh, capturing the, um, the stress in the, in the, in the, in the stance of a, of a business person through the, the drawing um, or capturing the excitement or capturing the action or what have you. So I love the um, comic book format. Uh, we have one that is for uh, professors and students right now, but soon we'll have about five. We've got about 10 comic books, but we have to package them up well. So the one to answer your question about how they've sold, I haven't tried hard enough to sell Braun collection materials because they're not right now my cash generator and I got four kids to feed. Um, and so my cash generator is the speech writing and book writing and I sort of uh, take the cash from that and reinvest it in the time and the, the, um, the people who help repackage the Braun collection material. So I have not tried, very hard to sell. Um, the comic books uh, have been used once in one classroom since uh, about four months ago when we put them online. Again, I haven't tried to sell at all. They're not available on Amazon. I don't market them. So um, I, I'd like people to. Um, professors, uh, the, the skill here in terms of what we're doing with Braun Collection, what I've realized is that, um, you know, the big, the writ large thing that requires or requests professors to change is that they have to want to be interested in CEO stories, okay? And that's a different thing. I mean, that is a different thing. We are essentially requesting that they use a new genre in their teaching. It's a very valuable genre. I'm totally, genre, I'm totally committed to it, um, but it's a little different than a case study. And we're asking them to take a risk. Michael Goldberg is a true rare um, species of professor who is willing to, have fun and take those risks and see what works. So he has used billion or bust. Um, and uh, so, uh, but you know, we are requesting uh, change uh, from professors and that's gonna take time. You know, I'm not a professor, so I have to gain credibility with them. Um, I have to show them that we actually do support them and, and uh, give them actual facts on how these CEO stories uh, benefit student learning. And that's just gonna take time. Yeah, I think uh, that's certainly a new revenue model for you guys, um, the Braun Collection, and really pitching to those professors that they need to then, you know, have these students purchase a book, like we had to purchase um, <laughs> this book for this class, Billion, billion or Bust. Um, so I guess kind of what is part of your pitch to them uh, for the CEO genre? Um, the pitch to the professors? Or the to the professors, yeah, to yeah. get them to buy into this. Yeah, great question. And by the way, I'd love to ask people, and I want honest feedback, uh, but if you care to during the chat, if you did uh, purchase and read the book or peruse the book or what have you, um, let me know if you have thoughts or advice or information or feedback or anything else, because I truly genuinely would like to know. Um, you guys are great to test it out. In any case, um, so uh, the pitch is generally that uh, we know that case studies, which are one way that business students learn, okay, about, um, I forget now, I don't have it right in front of me, but something like 40 to 60% of business um, MBAs, uh, business, uh, and uh, to a slightly lesser extent, undergrad business classes are taught using cases. We know about 10% are taught using experiential or immersive learning. We know about 10% are taught using gaming and um, the remainder are taught using lectures, okay? So these are the different ways that people teach. Um, and uh, we know that cases, which I think Kate, this, the, the, the executive biography, memoir, comic book, true, action, true adventure tale, they're um, sort of a cross between immersive experiential learning because you do become immersed in the text, presumably, and a case study. Um, we know that case studies get a little bit of um, uh, uh, criticism. They're terrific. I love case studies, but they get some criticism for being overly situational. And we know that students really want mentors. They want role models. They want to see action. They want to see decisions. They want to see it in 
in practice. And so that's really, they learn better. Students remember better. We know as a fact, students remember better when things are done in a storytelling format. And so, you know, we're just pitching that um, this is what students remember. They can see CEOs using these tools in the book, in practice, in the comic book. Um, and so it really builds on the strengths of a case study, but adds some immer immersion, some uh, understanding of character and patterns and decision-making patterns. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty solid pitch. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a professor, so I guess not uh, one that yeah, you're pitching well, to. Yeah, Michael at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we had some questions about um, the ghostwriting process and about um, how that's been like. Um, so kind of in that genre, um, Rosalind had a question about what is the process of ghostwriting a book? Um, and then uh, Michelle tagged onto that with, um, what would you say are the most important skills ne needed to ghostwrite and how do you create a narrative that isn't necessarily yours? Sure, okay, great. Great question, Rosalind and Michelle. Um, the process, I'm pretty um, process driven. Um, and so in terms of writing a book, uh, I'm very draft driven. And um, so the way I like to do it is to, uh, you know, we, we of course, uh, first and foremost have to do extensive interviews uh, with a, an executive. So let me just call it the executive, the subject, okay? They're the, the subject or the author. Um, when you're ghostwriting for them, they're the author or the subject. I'll call them the author. So we do a significant, I'm the writer, but they're the author. They're the named author. So significant interviews. So that is anywhere from six to 15 hours up front of interviews um, to get a first draft done. And we do a, a lot of research. Um, uh, Professor Goldberg's wife, Stacy, was actually one of our, she was the best, uh, writer and ghostwriter uh, that I've worked with in my career. She's just terrific. So she um, was a core part of our team uh, for a while and then was able to do her own uh, ghostwriting and writing. But in any case, so we do a lot of research, a lot of interviewing. Um, and then we just do a draft. We just pump out a draft. I mean, try to make it between 20,000 and 40,000 words typically. Um, and then, uh, it, we do usually most books have about five content drafts. And so each one involves getting it to the, um, the author and getting their feedback, whether verbal or written, um, and then just making further changes, tightening it up, tightening it up, tightening it up. And the first draft is always the hardest. Um, if you go and Google, you know, quotes on first drafts by authors, it's known to be the hardest because especially for ghostwriters, you know, I have pattern recognition. I've done a lot of books. Um, I know the pattern. I know the first draft stinks. It's horrible. You're like, how are we going to get a good book out of this? It's, but the people that I'm writing for, this is the only book they've ever done. And they don't know that, trust me, eventually this book is going to be good. This first draft, by the way, when I submit another bill, and so now you're paying me to read this piece of junk that you do not like, the facts are wrong, the voice is wrong, the stories you've told in your head for years that seem funny aren't funny when you actually see them on paper. So the first draft is the worst. And then we do a, after we get to about draft five, roughly to get enough feedback. So we're in their voice. There's no magic to getting in somebody's voice. It's not magical. It is a process. Um, so we get to draft five and then we do um, copy edit, uh, fact check, and then we go into production with it. Um, so that's the process. Um, the skills, um, it's a great question. So for what I do, I, um, I, I think about it as the skill of, I have, I believe the skill of writing at about, um, uh, a seven and a half out of 10, if a 10 point scale scale is 10 is like Michael Lewis or, um, something like that. Um, uh, I'm a seven and a half maybe, which is pretty good, but it's not eight, nine, 10. And I also have a skill uh, and knowledge base in business. So that's sort of, if you will, my, my beat. Um, you have beat reporters in journalism. They cover the sports beat or the basketball beat or whatever. And so I have, um, I'd say a seven and a half out of 10 on business. I've run businesses. I was an entrepreneur. I've invested in business. I you know, have my MBA. 
I understand decision making. I understand it's not done perfectly. I understand our batting average for decisions uh, is, uh, you know, we're lucky. I, actually, I shouldn't use a batting average analogy because Michael is right. I know nothing about professional sports. I am athletic. I do sports, but I don't, I've never watched a football game in my life uh, or a baseball game or anything. So, um, so I can't use a batting average analogy. But anyhow, we don't make decisions, uh, good decisions frequently uh, or all the time. So it's just that skill, that intuitive, uh, emotional understanding of knowing that um, uh, as much as today's environment, um, it tends to be disliking of CEOs and capitalism. Uh, I happen to think that CEOs are um, achievement oriented, driven, hardworking, generally. I mean, I, I certainly don't think they're martyrs, <laughs> but uh, I like them. I like their achievement orientation. I like their inclination to make decisions and there's a skill there because if you don't like them and you don't like that and you don't like the decision making orientation then um you know you, you can't write about it well or write for it well thanks and then a follow-up from abby who is a senior chemical engineering major uh what is the most rewarding part of ghost writing for you sure okay thanks abby by the way just to go back um one thing with michelle also michelle the the skill um and I think it's a, it's a trait or a skill is to, it's some, I think you have to be really pretty um, at once confident and humble, um, experienced and confident and humble because you, I mean, you put out something that you've worked so hard on and every time I, almost every time you get something back from, you know, a top level executive that they really may not like frequently. And I have enough experience and pattern recognition to be like, you know, chill. Like, I, I know, I know, but I'll just work and we'll get it better. And they need to see that I'm not going to break down from that process. I'm not breaking down from it. You know, we're going to get this done. It's okay. You can give me tough feedback. We're going to get this done. And so um, the first time you experience that, it can be pretty, uh, pretty rough, but you gain enough confidence and pattern recognition to know you know, this happens every time. I'll just give an example, just so it's very real. I have a CEO who um, is a new one I'm working for. I have not worked with the CEO before. They're the head of a tech healthcare company in uh, San Francisco. I just started working with them uh, earlier this week and they asked for a draft rapidly, urgently. Um, and uh, they uh, absolutely do not think the draft is at all good. And that's what I'm dealing, I mean, it's what you deal with all week, every week, it's, it's the job, it's what you do. But um, I just want to give an example, you know, it's not uh, a good feeling, but I'm so accustomed to it that I'm just like, you know, all right, well, let's game on, let's, what do you want? So anyhow, okay, what was Abby's question again? <laughs> the, the most rewarding part of uh, ghostwriting. Certainly you just talked about the hardest part, um, but what's the most rewarding part? When people get the book they want. It's usually, there's usually a lag time between when the book is done there's a real um, emotional uh, cycle to doing a book, to doing anything, to being an investor, to being an entrepreneur, and certainly to doing a book for the, the people who I'm writing for. And I've come to realize that there's a real, um, I don't know what it is, a cycle emotionally for them. And especially just before you're going into production or you're, before you're publishing, um, people are pretty, have a lot of bravado early on. They're like, I'll say anything about anybody. I'll say whatever, you know, um, I'll do whatever. And, and I'll, I'll give an example. Um, if you guys did read the Lanham Napier book, Billionaire Bust, I don't think he'd mind my saying that, you know, early on he was like, yeah, this, this was tough and this was brutal and I'll say anything. And then beforehand, he's like, ah, I don't know. Just before you, just before you publish, you're like, oh my God. And and um, the reality is what you should write is something um, in between those two scenarios, not the bravado, I wanna get this off my chest, I gotta get it off my chest, and not the um, scared scenario later on uh, of, oh my God, did I reveal too much or was I too harsh on people or whatever. There's something really in between, but the point is that there's this cycle once they publish, they give it to people and they don't realize. When you give a book to people, they don't sit there and go, I'm going to read this right away. I'm going to read it right away. I'm going to read it right away and give you really good feedback. That's not how people do. Think about when you get a book from somebody, you're like, it sits around for a few months. And so, but once they start getting feedback that people really learned from it, they really loved it. Um, 
And then the subjects whom I write for, or the authors whom I write for, say this was this was terrific and they recommend you to everybody they know and they're like you got to do this you got to do your own book you know um type of thing it's just really rewarding when they see and they, they every time every time they say i didn't think i was going to be able to finish this i hated it um uh that first draft killed me and you just stuck with it and you did a great you just you just did a great job and it's just really rewarding to walk really achievement oriented, driven, hard charging people through that and have them say, you did it. Yeah, I, I would imagine as a CEO, just seeing that book on shelves, seeing your face on your on the cover is just amazing experience for them and for you as well. Um, it's amazing. We, got, we don't, we don't, just to be clear, Edward, we haven't, we haven't sold a lot of books. It goes back to, I truly genuinely haven't tried as hard as I'd like because I didn't raise the capital to get a gotcha. sales force and marketing. Mm -hmm. So it really is just purely me, but I just wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to emphasize, and they, they, I think they'd probably say, you know, for the Braun collection books, you know, they'd love it if I would ramp up the selling. But in any case, I should say yeah. completing a book is really rewarding. I would sure love to be able to sell more books. <laughs> that has not been my skill. That has not been my skill set yet. <laughs> it will, it will yeah. come back to me two years from now. <laughs> Great. Uh, we have one or two questions about ghostwriting in the Braun collection, and then we'll move back um, to Jumpstart because we had, we had a few questions about that, and I think people are interested about the Cleveland entrepreneurship experience. Um, so this one came from Cameron. What was the most interesting story that you had in creating the Braun collection or and talking with CEOs, um, whether it's in writing their books or in just ghostwriting for them in general? Oh, that's a great question. Um, let's see. They, uh, you know... I think um, I really, uh, God, I learn, I learn, I have the greatest job in the world, first of all. I get to learn all these amazing lessons. And I'd say about 60 to 70% of the CEOs for whom I've written, at some point, um, they uh, they cry. And, and it's weird for me because I'm sort of a like waspy New Englander who doesn't do emotions well. So I'm like, I don't know, am I supposed to hug you? Am I supposed to hand you a Kleenex? I don't know. But, you know, they cry from the lessons they learn. Um, they're emotional. Um, so in any case, I would say the so many lessons, but the one that strikes me most, maybe because it was one of the early ones, was um, I wrote two books, two books for people, uh, one for the chairman and CEO and one for the president and CFO of um, Standard Oil of Ohio called Sohio. In any case, Standard Oil, I'll keep a long story really, really short. They essentially built the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, okay, from uh, the North Slope of Alaska when the largest reserves of oil in North America ever were hit and uh, by Sohio's wildcatting operations. So anyhow, they built this Trans-Alaska Pipeline. It was incredibly expensive, incredibly big deal, incredibly hard, seven years and something like, in today's dollars, $30 billion that these two Clevelanders uh, raised. Um, and when BP uh, acquired uh, Standard Oil of Ohio, after these guys get, you know, 70 hours a week of work for, um, for seven years, um, just nonstop work, not seeing their family, as soon as oil got turned on, I mean like the day oil got turned on to flow through the pipeline, uh, BP called them over to um, their, its headquarter offices in uh, London, uh, or outside of London, and summarily fired them. Um, and so they'd done all this work and thought that, you know, uh, anyhow, so summarily fired them. And listening to their lessons about this, um, they both went into depressions uh, separately. They, they, they weren't super fond of each other because uh, in any case, they both, and I wrote books for each of them, separate books, but uh, they went into depressions because once you're, um, and you may have read about it with Billionaire Bust and Lanham's thing, but once you're deposed as a CEO, it, it's a very quick reminder that there are many people in business who like you for your power and your title. And just, I would advise, and it's, it's an incredible reminder. And I would just advise students on the call today, go after everything in your career that you want to go after. I mean, with the balance and everything else, but go after it. Or even if you don't have balance, some people are so driven and passionate that they don't have balance. But just remember that um, if you're CEO, it always ends either with you retiring or you being forced out in some way. And um, 
your true friends and I mean, it, it's not personal. Don't make it personal. You know, it, I know it feels so personal, but try to just remember that lesson. Once you're, you're gone or you're deposed or whatever, the phone calls stop coming in and people stop sucking up to you. The suck up game ends when you're deposed. You're like, you're like this, you're like kryptonite or whatever. So that was, that was just an interesting lesson. So, yeah, I think, I think it's a good lesson for our students to, to take to take in, especially those that are interested in being entrepreneurs and starting businesses um, once they graduate. Um, but like I said, we're going to switch now to a, an earlier portion of your career with Jumpstart. Um, I'd like to start off just with a question. What was it like in that early Cleveland ecosystem back in uh, the early 2000s? Sure. Okay, great. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was sort of, I would say, a tale of two cities. It was... Uh, Great and not so great. Um, I was, I had come from Boston. Um, I married a Clevelander um, and I was an entrepreneur. I started a tech company called Supplier Insight. It was, I co-founded it and was CEO and we grew it through angel and venture capital. And uh, it was ultimately merged into Procuri and acquired by Ariba. So that's just background that I got here as a 20, 28 year old uh, woman in Cleveland. And it was like hitting a brick wall. Um, okay, it was like hitting a brick wall. It is professionally, I love Cleveland socially and family-wise, love it. Have always loved it professionally and family-wise. I am here, I chose love and I'm happy I chose love and that's why I'm in Cleveland. It's great, I don't have regrets about choosing love to be here. It's the most beautiful choice you can make. So that's great, okay? But I have some negative things to say, <laughs> which is it was a brick wall. It was conservative it, it, and it still is. Cleveland is always, it seems to me, um, and Michael may be tearing his hair out because uh, I know that uh, he, I suspect he's a, a strong advocate for Cleveland professionally, and I, I know we want people to stay here, but it is a brick wall for a, a 28 year old female. Um, I did have, so there was sort of this underground, undercurrent subculture movement of people who wanted to be entrepreneurial. And what was fantastic was that subculture was so galvanized and so organized and, the, and it was terrific. So it was really, really cool to see that come together. And you could have people who were strident, people who were passionate, people who were different um, come together and have capital put behind it. Um, I'm of the opinion that this is not hard to do, that we just need capital. I, I get tired of all the people wringing their, ha wringing their hands. What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? Uh, it's a whole ecosystem. Oh, you don't need money. You really need um, talent. I'm, uh, to me, yeah, okay, you need talent. Guess how talent comes? Guess what? In the business world, business is about power and resources, and it takes money. That's what it's about. It's about money and the talent will come. So I, anyhow, you can see I feel strongly about that, but it did come together back then. Uh, it did come together back then. Um, it was terrific to see that. It was fun. It, it was energized. Um, and I don't know if that's happening now because um, I, uh, was, I, I, I couldn't have been more mission-driven and oriented towards just getting entrepreneurs capital. Just take this money, okay? I'm a fiduciary. I'm a steward. I'm not smart. I'm just, I'm a vehicle for getting money out to these entrepreneurs. They're the ones putting their, you know, their family lives on the line to do this. My job is not to over question it. I, my job isn't to be smart. I like people try to be too smart in this environment. It makes me crazy. Just get the money out to entrepreneurs and some are going to be smart enough to figure out how to use it and others won't. And you just need a process to make that happen and to cover your, arse uh, to make sure that you're not like, um, you know, um, uh, giving it out just to your friends or something like that. But in any case, so I, I'm wandering a little bit, I think, in my comments, but uh, it was energized. It was good. It was terrific. It was also a brick wall. It's a very conservative culture here professionally. It's behind with respect to women in business, minorities in business. Um, and it's uh, very frustrating. And to be honest, it makes me angry. Uh, but I try to deal with it by, uh, I don't know how I deal with it. Getting, maybe getting that capital to the people that you want to see grow, I guess. I did. That's what I did. Now I, I drink. No, I'm kidding. I don't drink. I don't, I don't know how I deal with it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I talk to you guys. I, talk, I use you guys as, as a therapy session for getting out my anger. But Cleveland has a long way to go, especially in the... Um, seed angel and venture community with respect to women and minorities it has so far to go and words don't work it's gonna you know uh, 
So, but that's yeah. a whole different yeah. session. <laughs> <laughs> I guess on a, on a more lighter note, we, we got this question from Mitch. Um, what was your favorite company at Jumpstart to work with or your favorite idea that came through the, um, the pipeline there? Thanks, Mitch. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's interesting because uh, I truly, I, this, I, I'm embarrassed to say I can't tell you because it's so far in my past now. I left in August of 2010 and we're in 2020. Yeah. Um, and so it was, a, it was from 2004 to 2010, 2003 to 2010. We had 55 companies when I was there and we built up that portfolio. Um, uh, I left just after uh, announcing our investment in Cover My Meds. I'd like to say that's my favorite, but I never, I, I um, led the team that made the investment in Cover My Meds. So I'm happy to take the halo effect that nobody's given <laughs> for, for doing that. I didn't overanalyze any of these investments. I was like, this is a volume game. This is a velocity game. This is about velocity. Just get money out to companies and force people to not overthink this. Um, uh, purely velocity game. Um, so I, uh, we worked with a lot of them. I led the team that worked with the companies, but I can't tell, I can't tell you, uh, I can't tell you which was my favorite. I'm sorry. Wish I could. I, okay. You know, it's interesting. I have people come back to me even now and ask me about, um, you know, uh, people from Jumpstart. Um, I'm not actually involved at all. I, you know, when you move on, you move on. And I'm not involved at all in the entrepreneurial community now. I'm still happy to talk about my jumpstart days, but I'm not involved in it because I am an entrepreneur again. Yeah. I'm growing my company and I'm so just driven to just get revenues and sales and feed my family and grow the company. I just don't know. I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, we, we had a question earlier from Travis also that I think maybe you could answer, maybe you could answer your favorite one, but this maybe is more direct. What was the most valuable thing companies did to help them succeed early on? And you can take this from Baran as well, the most valuable thing that you did um, to help you succeed early on in your startup. Uh, great question too. I think knowing, knowing what you're talking about, knowing your industry. I think Pretty it's simple, yeah. really important because if you're taking investment or talking to customers or whatever, yeah, it is pretty simple. It's interesting though, Edward, because um, because uh, I think so many of us get stars in our eyes about how we wanna just be high growth. Well, okay, mm -hmm. fine, you wanna be high growth, but do you know what you're talking about in the field of where you wanna be high growth? Because if you don't, it's eventually gonna come out and you're eventually gonna get screwed by somebody, an investor, a customer, a, a colleague. So I'll give an example, when I was, um, at Supplier Insight, okay, so what happened was I moved to Cleveland, I worked at a private equity fund in Cleveland, I had worked at a private equity fund in Boston, I was 28 years old, and I found two guys who I knew said, let's start this company, Supplier Insight, this was back in 1999, okay, so we had the tech boom, the internet boom. This relates to your question, by the way, about yeah, uh, sure, sure. what, so, uh, so, um, so relates, so I, we decided, um, and I thought it was neat. We decided I would be CEO because uh, I don't know why we decided that. So that's sort of part of the whole problem. It was a tech company. And that's a little bit, uh, me being the head of a tech company is, I, is a little bit like um, me being the head of the NFL, right? I mean, like it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't make a whole, lot of, a whole lot of sense. We just wanted to take advantage of the internet boom in Cleveland where it hadn't hit yet. And we had a good idea. And so I didn't know what I was doing. So now fast forward, and, and I saw it, um, I didn't know the industry. So we had programmers and I, I, I was like, uh, what's a huddle, what's a huddle, what's, um, you know, we were doing, and, and um, I'm, a, I'm a nice person, I'm smart, I work hard, whatever, but I still couldn't really, and I know how to raise money, and, but I still couldn't lead a team in an industry that I didn't know. It was, it was, it was internet era crud. Um, so at Jumpstart, I saw, companies doing something similar. Um, people who weren't willing to go through absolute despair, which happens at companies, okay? When you run a company, you will go through periods of despair, but they're willing to go through despair. They're willing to fire people, hire people, um, have difficulty with their families because what they're doing, they're so good at and they love so much that they will still do that. They will 
have hard conversations with investors because they know their stuff and they're confident. They can have the hard conversation with the investor, with the employee, with whatever. And so when I left Jumpstart, you heard me say earlier, I love, I love writing. I'm not great at it, but I know I'm good at it. And I know I can sit eight hours a day and I can write and I love it. And I wanted something where if I brought on, let's say a board of directors or investors or whoever who thought that they wanted to take, I'm fine if we go around where I reduce control, but I need to be the one who is like, I will go through despair for you guys because I know how to write this book. I know how to do this. And I have gone through periods of despair um, uh, because you know, cash flow is not coming in or somebody's trying to do something with the business that I think they shouldn't. Um, or somebody's criticizing it or whatever. But so that's what I think um, is the most important thing I learned. Do what, do what, you, do what you love, do what you know. Um, and get, gain, a, gain a skill, gain a knowledge base. You have to gain that because otherwise you're just a bunch of opinions and you're a hothead um, and, you, you, and you're not going to go through the long haul. Yeah, I think that's another, another solid, solid advice for our, for our students looking to be entrepreneurs. Um, there's a saying in writing uh, to write what you know. And I think that kind of bleeds into that as well with, um, with starting up what you know. Um, we're gonna shift a little bit now into some questions about kind of your background um, a little bit. For people that don't know, uh, you had a degree in linguistics um, from Harvard, then you went on to your MBA. Um, so we had a question from Sam about how your degree in linguistics and familiarity with a few other languages, including Russian and uh, French has helped you in your career as a business person. And then a follow up on that, um, you can answer both of these at once. This one comes from Daryl, how your humanities degree has prepped you um, or how it prepped you for uh, business school. He said that he is interested, in, he's considering an MBA himself. Okay, so the second question is how what prepped me for? Um... Uh, how, how your humanities undergraduate work helped you prepare for business school. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so linguistics, it's not that relevant to, it's relevant to what I do now as a writer to some extent, but one misconception about linguistics is that um, we're, uh, well, so what linguistics is, what I did, there's all different types of linguistics. To keep it short, I specialized in syntax. Lingu modern linguistics is quite an analytical field. It is not sitting around um, reading books. It's not language. It's not English. It's not any of that. It is pretty analytical. I majored in uh, linguistics, but uh, my specialty was, was, was syntax, and that's the structure of sentences. Um, m almost all my homework was problem sets. You're really looking at um, problem sets from all kinds of different languages and Proto-Indo-European. So it's, the point is here that it's quite analytical. Um, I didn't, my thesis, my honors thesis looks like a chemist. I actually used chemistry st software to write it back at the time um, uh, because it's, um, it's, it's uh, sentence trees and, se and syntactic structures. And so the chemistry software helped with that. So I think the, ana the analytical part um, uh, is useful uh, for um, business. Um, so that's really the main thing. And certainly for ghostwriting, one of my things that I enjoy most when I, when I did linguistics, I really enjoyed the lexicon, the syntax, the structure of, uh, of other languages. And so when I listen to a CEO speak, I think I pick up a little bit more quickly than other people might on their lexicon and even their um, their syntax, their rhythm, are they simple sentence structures? Are they, is their le lexicon Latinate or Germanic or what is it? So, but not much, honestly. I mean, not much. It's why I got an MBA, right? I think if I had majored in business and engineering, I might not need my MBA, right? Uh, but I went to get an MBA. So, um, uh, and then how did linguistics prepare me for, what was the other question? How it uh, have prepared you for your MBA and then how you use that as an entrepreneur. Oh, I talked about so how you... my career. I didn't talk about yes. my MBA. Uh, yeah. I don't think it helped me with either. I don't think it helped me much with either. I mean, I think uh, I, I, certainly the parts of the brain, and I haven't looked into this, that you use to analyze languages and do those pro problem sets feel very familiar to um, 
uh, to building financial models. I love building financial models. I love, it's a story with numbers, right? I, I just love that. Um, and uh, so I love using Excel and um, uh, just doing sensitivities and scenarios and uh, pivot table. I, you know, I love all that. So I think the analysis, um, it just feels like you're using a similar part of the brain. Did we lose Edward? Um, okay, uh, looks like we lost Edward. That's why you got me. You got me in the bullpen. Um, I think the last question we were just texting in the background. I saw one from um, Max Pennington, a sophomore chemical engineer, said, "If you were able to go back and start again at the beginning of your career, would you do anything differently this time around?" Uh, okay, Max. Thank you. Would I do anything differently? Uh, no. Uh, I'm sure I should say I'm sure I should say yes, but no, because I really see each thing uh, as its own adventure and uh, in learning um, about myself and what I should do. So. I think I'm honestly genuinely not creative enough to think about what I should have done differently. I think I'm only able to see what I did and figure out what I learned from it. So I can give an example. Um, when I first got to Cleveland, I had been at a, um, at a combo, a combination private equity fund and consulting firm called Parthenon in Boston, okay? And I, I married this Clevelander, this wonderful Clevelander, and uh, we moved here and I went to a private equity fund here. Um, and certainly, um, I think that uh, going to the private equity fund, uh, I went to the private equity fund because I thought the word private equity, I honestly, I just feel, felt like, I don't know, private equity is, is, I don't know, I think I thought it was cool. I mean, I, that sounds shallow. It wasn't as shallow quite as that, but I think I was just like, I don't know, pays well, it's cool, so I'll do it. And um, Private equity, I didn't research it adequately. I just didn't research it adequately. Private equity in Cleveland is so much more conservative until Riverside came along. Riverside has uh, really changed private equity in Cleveland, um, if you're familiar with the private equity environment here. But I really didn't research it very well at all. Uh, I got the job and I was like, this is great. I'll just, you know, it's easy. It's easy for me to move and do this. And, and I, I really, really didn't like it. I am not a conservative business person. Um, it was more like being at a, at a bank, a traditional bank, and I didn't like it. So you could say, should I have changed that? But to me, I learned that I need to research more and that I'm not at all good in a conservative professional environment. And it really is the thing that made me realize that. So I guess, um, you know, the only other thing I can think of as I, as I sort of uh, blabber here is my... Um, my father, whom I admire tremendously, he always told me that I had to figure out how to uh, make a living, you know, uh, which is a valuable thing for a father to tell a child. Um, and he didn't think that linguistics or languages uh, would be a good way to make a living. And I can understand why a parent might have that concern. It's informative for me with four kids uh, to, you know, uh, to uh, have that. Uh, understand it, but he was he was wrong. So I think um, because I, okay, I was a linguistics major at Harvard. I was going to get my my PhD my PhD if I didn't get an MBA, I was going to get my PhD in um, linguistics from MIT. And it's a long story that I'll keep super short, which is I had my application for my PhD for cognitive science from MIT, which is what linguistics is is at uh, MIT. It's cognitive science, and my MBA application for Harvard. And I uh, decided not to put my application for MIT in the in the in the mailbox or whatever it was way way back in 1993, um, because I just thought I'm not going to be able to make a living doing this. And it turns out, uh, and I was going to do some corpus analysis. Corpus analysis back then was analysis of language writ large. Okay, so then Google comes along. I mean, I could have potentially been. A, 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 you know, that's a linguistics technology. That is a natural language search. We didn't know about that. We had, back in 1993, there was none of this on the horizon, okay? We had no idea. We had no idea. Maybe if I had gone to MIT, I would have seen some precursors to it and been working with some people. But the point is, you know, my, my, my I don't think, my, I think you need to do what you're passionate about. And I really love linguistics. I always say it's my first love. 
But at the end of the day, do I regret that? I don't because um, I ultimately have gotten back to language essentially with writing, which is not as analytical as linguistics, but I've gotten back to it. Um, and I took the path I took. And I, I still say, I said at the beginning of this call, for me, probably the best lesson I've learned, the thing I'm most proud of, and it's an unusual, it's not rare, but it's unusual choice today is that I, I chose love. I chose my husband, the man I was dating wanted to come to Cleveland. He had a family business here. And if I had become a professor of linguistics or what have you, I would have been going around the country and I wouldn't have um, been able to marry him. And it's not cool today to choose love. It's not considered independent. It's not considered we're supposed to be independent. But um, when I look back at whether I have regrets, I always say, I don't have regrets because I chose love and it's a beautiful choice. I think, I think that's a fantastic note to end on. Um, thank you, Becca, for speaking to us, being in the class, and thank you for everyone who joined on Facebook Live and here in the Zoom webinar. And uh, thank you to Professor Goldberg for hosting us. And I think he has one or two more quick things to plug before we wrap up. Sure, great. Um, thanks, Eddie, for hosting and Becca for joining us. This is great. Um, it's awesome, obviously, um, I've known Becca as as a um, as a personal friend and collaborator on my book and um, working with my wife, and so we overlap in a number of different areas. But um, it, and I've had her in class before, and I think in some ways, as hard as this whole online teaching world has been and the disruption for all the students and um, folks back at home. Um, sometimes these things really actually work and Becca this format today and the questions from the students and Eddie your moderation was uh, it was a great hour and I think it actually built on a lot of the themes that we've been talking about in the class about you know the challenge that startup founders have and and I think Becca your candor for what's worked well and what hasn't worked as well as maybe you liked um, I think is really instructive and helpful for the students so um, Thank you for doing that. We will be back with our class. I did mention the two events um, that we have this week. We'll be back um, in class on Tuesday with Becca, I think somebody you know, Tim Mueller, um, oh, good. local entrepreneur talking about exit. And then one change to the syllabus next Thursday at one o'clock, we'll be joined by um, Arti Shadna. Arti is a uh, Case Western Reserve University board member and has a background in, in tech as an entrepreneur um, as well. And she's an impact investor. So this will be along with some of the same things you guys are doing on the project right now on the Aim to Flourish. And we heard about from Mel and Ashley in class. So um, I haven't posted the assignment yet, but it's gonna be looking at an opportunity that actually Artsy's looking at right now. And then the last week is actually two other folks from the coast, Walker Jacobs, who's the chief revenue officer from Twitch is gonna join. Um, and Shabika's gonna moderate that. And then our last panel will be, um, last discussion as part of this class is Andy Flom, whose company was acquired by Slack and Victor's gonna moderate that panel. By the way, how many of you, use your little hands, how many of you are Slack users? Or your real hands, okay. Because I think we're gonna try to do something on Slack with Andy and Slack to kind of give folks some experience using that platform that might be fun. Um, Okay, so until then, unless I see, and thanks to those of you who are on Facebook Live and from the community you're joined, we really do appreciate um, your engagement and support. So uh, I'll see students back next week or tonight at seven o'clock if you wanna keep, keep the party going with these, with these sessions. Um, and again, Eddie and Becca, thank you for your time today.